The sign says, when you step off this walk, you enter an early California ranch as it was in the 1880s. This is now the Leonis Adobe Museum. Originally built in 1844, it is one of the oldest private residences and surviving buildings in LA County and declared a Los Angeles Historic Cultural Monument number one in 1962. Located in what is now Calabasas, California, the ranch was occupied by the wealthy rancher Miguel Leonis until his death in 1889. Leonis was a bearded, six foot four inch native of the Basque region in the French Pyrenees who never learned to speak any other language than Basque. He controlled much of the west end of the San Fernando Valley and part of Ventura County and according to the LA Times, quote, came to Southern California as an ignorant Basque sheep herder and blossomed into a robber baron holding feudal sway by the aid of a small army of vaqueros. Vaqueros is another way of saying cowboy or animal herder, and he uses vaqueros to expand his herding grounds for thousands of acres, in some cases allegedly by force. It was said that at the time of his death, quote, his flocks and herds ranged over a hundred hills, and his lands were measured in mileage rather than acres. Leonis's wife, Espiritu, was a Chumash Indian, and she only spoke her native language as well. Leonis did not recognize her as his wife at the time of his death, but she contested his will, claiming that they shared a deceased daughter whose grave listed him as the father. Much of what we know about Leonis was written about him by those who he considered his enemies, claiming that he settled arguments with vindictive lawsuits or a gang of hitmen at midnight, but these accounts are one-sided, so it should probably be taken with a grain of salt. Leonis, the Basque King of Calabasas, died in September 1889 while driving a wagon across the Coenga Pass near Hollywood allegedly drunk on wine, and he somehow fell off and tumbled under the wheels, which may or may not have been an accident. According to legend, the Leonis Adobe is haunted. The first account of Leonis's ghost appearing at the Adobe came in the 1920s. The new residents heard footsteps on the stairs, followed by two loud thuds from the upstairs bedroom resembling the sound of boots dropping to the floor. When the residents went upstairs to investigate, the room was filled with a strong soap aroma, a smell associated with Leonis who always appeared impeccably clean and smelled of soap. The noises continued and the new owners learned to live with what they concluded was the prior owner's ghost. There are several other ghost stories surrounding the house, but to me, it has a warm, homey feeling and I wouldn't mind living here to be honest. It just needs a pool and I'd feel right at home. It's interesting to see how people lived here over 150 years ago with no microwaves, no TV sets, and yet they seemed to get by just fine with everything they needed. Of course, this was considered rather wealthy at the time for this area and in many respects has maintained much of its original charm. For many centuries, this part of Los Angeles was littered with herds of longhorn steers that numbered in the thousands, with several honored here as a reminder of how things used to be. There are also about a dozen sheep that look like they've been recently trimmed, and as I stared closely into their eyes, noticed that they have rectangular pupils, which I presume give them a wide field of vision. They seemed to have a lot of personality, were highly social, and appeared to be very intelligent. They also had some beautiful horses, but being that it was such a hot day, they understandably were hanging out in the shade to stay cool. They also grow food like maize and pumpkin here, with some claiming that Calabasas comes from the Spanish word for pumpkin or squash. According to local legend, Calabasas got its name from a load of pumpkins that fell from the wagon of a Basque rancher in 1824 and sprouted the next spring. 
However, when I looked into it, I found an earlier reference, about 30 years earlier, by Padre Santa Maria, who wrote in his journal that he slept in Calabasas while searching for a suitable location for a new mission. I'm determined to get to the true origins and we'll be sure to bring it up in a future video when I get to the bottom of this. They also have their own vineyards here and hold periodic events for wine tasting, which I have not attended yet, but have heard that one of the most popular ways to drink wine in Basque country is by mixing it with Coca-Cola. They call it Kali Moko, so I'm not sure what to expect. Of course, the Basque have traditional ways of serving wine as well, and a rich history of Basque immigration into the Americas starting in the 1500s. The first wave settling mostly in Chile and Argentina, then establishing the commercial whaling industry in, in America during the 1700s, and many of them coming to California during the 1848 gold rush. The Basque are the oldest civilization on the European continent, and their precise origin remains unknown. They lived in the Pyrenees, where the first Cro-Magnon remains were discovered, and predated the wave of Indo-European or Aryan tribes during the second millennium BC, which dramatically changed the culture, genetics, and linguistics of Europe. Unlike other groups on the Iberian Peninsula, they were not conquered by the Moors, and they also successfully defended themselves from the Visigoths, Franks, and Normans. After many centuries of independence in Europe, the Basque were finally conquered and occupied by the Spanish in 1512, with the northern region ceded to France and the rest incorporated into Spanish territory. Despite this division, the Basque maintain seven historical provinces, which is interesting because, according to Plato's Timaeus, there were seven islands of Atlantis that were sacred to Persephone, and the others were sacred to Hades, Amun, and Poseidon. On the other side of the Atlantic, where there is evidence that the Basque had traveled to long before Christopher Columbus, there are many Native American tribes that also revere the Seven Sisters, commonly referred to as the Seven Stars that stand out in the cluster famous by its ancient Greek name as the Pleiades. Things become interesting when we consider that the prehistoric cave art in the Pyrenees, attributed to Cro-Magnon, seemed to portray the Pleiades in the constellation of Taurus, the bull, in a position reminiscent of Europa riding Zeus in the form of a bull as he kidnaps her and takes her to Crete. Europa was said to be a Phoenician princess and the Minoans of Crete were the first recognized civilization of Europe, which got its name from Europa. While the Phoenicians and Minoan civilization of Crete were said to be remnants of the earlier Atlantean civilization, which allegedly met its demise at the end of the Ice Age, the Basque also have legends of their origins being from seven islands in the Atlantic known to them as Atlantica. This symbol used to represent the Basque people and the Basque country, it's called Laburu, appears on Basque flags and many ancient Basque stone monuments and artifacts. And even though many people will recognize it as a swastika, that is a term that comes from India. And this symbol dates back 15,000 years in Europe, as can be attested to here etched in mammoth ivory by descendants of Cro-Magnon, which is about 10,000 years older than the earliest swastika symbol found in India, which was introduced to the subcontinent by Aryans that also introduced horses and chariots to India, not to mention Sanskrit itself, as well as the Indian caste system, which is now banned there along with accurate Indo-European or Aryan history. The first modern humans to occupy Western Europe, as well as North Africa, the Mediterranean, and the Levant were Cro-Magnon, who not only left cave art and fossil records in the Pyrenees, but are considered the direct ancestors of the Basque people, 
whose ancient language seems to come right out of the Ice Age. For example, the Basque word for knife means literally stone that cuts. And the word for ceiling means top of the cavern. While the Basque language does not have any links to Indo-European languages, there are those, such as Professor John Campbell, that claim that the language of the Iroquois and Basque were closely related. In Peter de Roo's book, History Before Columbus, published in 1900, he also claims a linguistic link between the Basque and certain Native American tribes, even postulating that the Basque originated in America. There have been claims by Basque missionaries that, when speaking their own language, it was understood by Indians of the Petén district in Guatemala. While I could not find any corroboration or verify this to my own satisfaction, the ancient Basque used to count in twenties rather than tens, a practice also found in Central America, with some Basque, like Mesoamericans, both practicing artificial cranial deformation. Besides the original Berber tribes of North Africa, the Basque have among the highest concentration of Rh negative blood in the world, with both the Basque and Berbers sharing genetic affinities to the native Guanches of the Canary Islands in the Atlantic, who all three are considered directly related to Cro-Magnon, recognized in any accredited university. However, what is often left out, or at least downplayed in most anthropology classrooms, is the fact that bifacial stone tool technology, known as Solutrian, similar to the kind introduced to Europe by Cro-Magnon, have also been found in the Americas, dating back to thousands of years before the accepted era of Clovis, which is another similar bifacial stone tool technology. That said, Pleistocene genetics on both sides of the Atlantic, such as haplogroup X, also adds complications to the out-of-Africa hypothesis, which claims that Europe was populated by modern humans, or Cro-Magnon, 40,000 years ago, by migrations from Africa, who later then populated the Americas around 15,000 years ago. Of course, DNA sequencing has demonstrated that not only was Cro-Magnon genetically identical to modern Europeans, but an article published in 2014 in Advances in Anthropology titled Reconsideration of the Out of Africa Concept as Not Having Enough Proof found that, quote, the first Europeans during the Aurignacian period were fair-skinned. Aurignacian period means Cro-Magnon from 40,000 to 28,000 years ago. It then says that, there was no archaeological proof of the appearance of anatomically modern humans in Africa dating before 100,000 years ago, stating that, quote, ancestors of the most present-day non-Africans did not come from Africa in the last 30,000 to 600,000 years at least. In other words, those who migrated from Africa or were forcefully taken out as slaves are not ancestors of the contemporary Europeans, Asians, Native Americans, Australians, or Polynesians. This follows from the whole multitude of data in anthropology, genetics, archaeology, and DNA genealogy. The paper goes on to say that the most ancient parts of the haplogroup tree, both Y chromosome and mtDNA, which are not found in Africa, are automatically attributed to Africans by proponents of the out-of-Africa hypothesis by default, which automatically makes all non-Africans of African descent. Quote, the article shows that the same data can be more justifiably interpreted as incompatible with the out-of-Africa concept and giving support for an into-Africa concept. It seems that from times of Neanderthal, our ancestors of both African and non-African current populations lived outside of Africa, apparently in Eurasia or maybe in Europe. I've already presented at least a dozen videos postulating that what shows up suddenly in Eurasia and Europe, genetically and culturally, 
likely came from somewhere in the Atlantic, as first proposed by the ancient Egyptians, Greeks, Berbers, and Basque. And even if that were not the case, what is becoming definitively clear is that the theory that academia pushed before the sequencing of the human and archaic genome this decade needs to be reconsidered scientifically instead of being force-fed to us politically. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.